privileged to tell you a story that uh, goes on for about 13.7 billion years. And I have to do that in 18 minutes. So that's quite a challenge, right? So let's get started right away. So, we humans, we are creatures bound by time. We are born, we live, and eventually we pass away. There is a very definite timeline in our existence. And it turns out, let me put this word, that um, everything that exists, every living creature has a time. Some live longer than others. Rocks have a time. Planets have a time. Stars have a time. Existence is not only ours, it's for everything that exists in the universe, not just living, but also inanimate matter. However, there's a very fundamental difference between us and the rest of the things that have an existence. And that fundamental difference is that we are aware of the time that is passing. And because we have a narrative, we all, each one of us, has a narrative, a story of our lives. We are fascinated by all stories. We are storytelling beings. And it is quite interesting that in this urge to understand our story, right, every big question, if you keep asking, where do I come from? And, and, and my family, and my country, and my planet, and the universe. Every story, if you start asking these questions backwards in time, they all go to the greatest, the grandest story that exists, which is the universe and its narrative, its story. And it turns out that something quite amazing that we nowadays, we have the privilege of being in the 21st century and understanding so much of this story, right? We can tell a lot about the universe, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that as much as I can in a few minutes. But what's really remarkable is that we have always asked these questions. So the fact that we are preoccupied nowadays with the Big Bang, with the story of the universe, does not make us any different than our ancestors. Because it turns out, and this is quite remarkable, that every culture that we know of in history has asked the question, where did everything come from? What is the origin of existence? Where did the world come from? Us, all animals. And that is a damn hard question. It is so difficult that there are many answers. So we are sort of familiar with the answer here in the West, which we read in the first part of the Bible, in the Genesis, right? Which has a story, a narrative of creation. Like God says, let it be, let it have their light, and light comes, and everything unfolds, and out of darkness, there is an organization that happens. And it turns out that every story of creation has this separation of chaos into order, of darkness into light, in which things emerge either by themselves or by the action of some god or gods, you know, because there are all sorts of stories that you can tell that all creation myths. But it turns out that they all have this idea that time either started a long time ago when the gods decided, or it may have been going on forever. Now, we here in the West, we know of this narrative where time actually had a beginning. And it turns out that that tells you that the universe has a history. And what's really remarkable is that modern science, with the Big Bang Theory, also tells a history of creation, a narrative in which the universe began a long time ago, right, and has been evolving ever since. And it turns out that in each one of us, in each one of our lives, in each one of our narratives, we carry within seeds of this cosmic history. So what's really amazing is that in this art that goes on for so long, we are the product of something, a history, that started so long ago, in fact, about 13.7 billion years ago. And there are many, many narratives of, 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 of creation, and it turns out, for example, that Stonehenge that you're seeing over there is actually not just a burial site, but it's actually a clock. It tries to reproduce the, mo the movements of the sky. 
So there is a preoccupation with this notion that there is a regularity, something that happens on and on and on in, in the history of the universe, in the history of the sky. And because of this regularity, we can actually nowadays do science, right? Science, in a sense, is this attempt at, to uncover the regularity, the order that exists in the And we have been doing this for a very short amount of time. I mean, modern science is only 400 years old, not that much at all. But we now can do something like this. We can take a picture like this. This is the most amazing picture. Well, perhaps not the most amazing because Rachel's pictures are also amazing, as you're going to see, but this is the other most amazing picture that you can possibly see. Because this is a picture where each one of these points, you can see there are some little smudges here and there, right? And say, oh, these are galaxies. Right? So each one of these little smudges is a galaxy. Now, what is a galaxy? A galaxy is a condensation of stars and galaxies. So we live in a galaxy, right? This galaxy is called the Milky Way, as you know, right? And our galaxy alone has about 100 billion stars. Okay? 100 billion stars, more or less the same number of neurons you have in your head, right? Now, each one of these stars, now we know, and we didn't know that 20 years ago, each one of these stars, the vast majority of these stars, also have planets. So stars and planets. So in our Milky Way alone, we, if we could take a picture of the Milky Way, it would be just one little point, one little smudge in that picture has trillions, trillions of worlds. So it's a staggering, that's why a phenomenally staggering number of different worlds. And each one of these points, they're all the little dots. The little dots are just stars. They are not. They are also galaxies. This is a map of the sky, which has about 5 billion light years. So basically it means that it maps a huge amount of space, and the distances between different galaxies are of hundreds of millions of light years. That means that light traveling at 300,000 kilometers a second, which doesn't mean anything here, let me say 186,000 miles per second. So it doesn't mean anything, but it's such a huge number. Let me say it's some, okay. Uh, you blink your eye, and light travels seven and a half times around the earth. Boom, that way, right? And it goes seven and a half times around the earth, and it turns out that the sun is about eight light minutes away from us. So if the sun goes right now, we will only find out in eight minutes. And of course, the last thing we'll ever find out, because the way it end immediately. But the point is that light travels, and it takes time for light to get to us. So when we look at the sky, and even when you look at the moon, or when you look at anything in the sky, you're actually looking backwards. The skies are a time machine. You never see the present. Whenever you see an object out there, you're actually looking backwards. And each one of these worlds has an origin, has a history, and because we now know the laws of physics and the laws of chemistry apply across this vast amount of space, their history is somewhat, somewhat like ours. So when we tell this history, when scientists try to uncover how the galaxies form, how does a star start, how come stars have planets traveling around them, we're actually uncovering ours. Because it turns out that we came from something like this. So that picture there is essentially a star-forming region of the universe. It's a mess, okay? It's a lot of very hot gas bubbling up, forming these huge, vast stars. And they all come together. They emit a huge amount of radiation. It's not a place you want to go for summer vacation, for sure, right? You would be radiated to that immediately. But the point is that when we can see that in the sky, we are actually looking, in a sense, at our own history because our sun, our star, right, also was born about five billion years ago. So it has a star, and, and with the sun, all planets were born. It turns out that the planets happen to be the leftover stuff from the formation of a star, you know? So you have a big blob of gas that starts to condense itself because of its gravitational attraction. You know, gravity likes to attract, and so stars because they have these big masses and everything in the universe spins and so these things are spinning around and so this gas is contracting and it's spinning 
And you know from making pizza that when you have a big blob of dough and you want to make it flat, you spin it, right? So it becomes flat. And that is exactly what happens to most solar systems. You have a star in the middle and you have all these planets spinning around you. And they are the leftover junk that didn't go into making this stuff. Right? But there's something quite beautiful about this because it tells you that the stuff that planets are made of is the same relatively speaking, of what stars are. And when you go back and you look at a picture like this, and you realize that stars are born, so they have a narrative that stars at some moment, moment in time, and they live for a while, and eventually they blow up very dramatically, right? And when they do that, they spit out their stuff. And what is a star? Well, a star is essentially a big ball of hydrogen, which is the simplest chemical element that exists. And it survives because at the core of the star, it manages to fuse hydrogen into helium and creates a huge amount of energy that wants to make it grow out. So you have a balance between this growing out and imploding in, and from that dramatic, unstable existence, a star survives for a very long time until it runs out of fuel. And then gravity that never ends, never ends, Takes over and the star implodes, rebounds, and spits out all the stuff of the star into interstellar space. And that stuff is what? All the chemical elements that we know. So, all the gold and the iron and the calcium, all the stuff that we are made of, came from exploding stars. So, when poets and musicians talk about we are stardust, we are stardust. It's actually beautiful, and it's true, right? Because all the atoms that make us up, they, do, they did come from exploding stars. So one thing that we learn when we study the universe and its dynamics is exactly this idea that creation and destruction walk hand in hand. So for a star to be born, another one has to die. And because of these cycles, all these chemical elements in the universe are cycling over and over again. And so it turns out that we happen to be in a beautifully stable, long-lived, small star. Our sun is a wonderful, nice star. Okay? It actually has been going on for about 5 billion years. It's going to go on for another 5 billion years, a little less. However, you know, Life is tough when your temperature at the core is about 15 million degrees, right? So things are a little dramatic in there, and eventually it's going to heat up a little bit. So in about 500 million years, the sun is going to heat up, and it turns out that we here won't be able to survive if we survive 500 million years, right? Because obviously, when we're talking astronomy and cosmology, we're talking huge numbers, and sometimes we say, who cares? Well, we care because it turns out that we have a history, we have a legacy, right? Everything that we imagine what will happen to all the tagged videos, if the sun explodes, where is all this data going to go to? Into stardust, into another planet? Who knows if that planet is going to have life? Because it turns out this is a completely off down picture here, but it was supposed to be a beautiful thing. It is a tiny little blue dot. That is the picture of Earth taken from Saturn. From Mars or okay. And Carl wrote a book called Pale Blue Dots, inspired by this photograph. It basically shows you that Earth, what we are, is tiny in comparison to us. So the whole of Earth, the whole of our history, all our private and collective origins are in this small little speck of dust that lives turning around the star. Right? So it turns out that people always say, you know, scientists are horrible because they come up with these facts and these discoveries. And it turns out that the more we learn about the universe, the less relevant we seem to be. Right? I mean, look at this. I mean, okay, before Copernicus, you know, when Columbus came here, we were the best, right? We were the center, made in the image of God, great. But then, of course, Copernicus comes and, no, you know, the Earth is just a planet. 
So it's moving around like Jupiter, etc. Not that interesting. And then, of course, you say, well, but at least our sun is a sun, right? But then, no, we have a galaxy which has billions and billions of suns. And then, of course, in the 1920s, we discovered that these galaxies are moving away from each other. So the universe is expanding, which doesn't mean that it's like the galaxy is a little bit of stuff from an explosion. It means that space itself can stretch like a rubber band, and it carries with it those galaxies. So that is what Einstein developed in his theory of general relativity. So the universe is sort of like space, it's like a stretch of it that is going outward. So we really are specks of nothingness. So the ends of existence, but so why even bother being alive? You remember Woody Allen saying, I'm not doing my homework because, you know, the Big Bang says I'm going to have a big crunch. Who cares about homework? So that is the lesson people think. However, it's really because you see this little blue dot. Let's make a better picture. That blue thing. That blue thing is taken from the astronauts uh, of Apollo 11 around the, around the moon. It's called the Earth rise. So we see the moon rising, they saw the Earth rising. And this is the home. And this place is extremely important. Because if you look around, things are not that Okay, Mars is an awful frigid desert. You, don't, you, can, you want to go there to understand a little bit about life, but it's not a great place. Venus is total hell. It rains sulfuric acid. The temperature at the surface is 500 degrees. It is beautiful to behold, but not to go there, right? And it turns out the Earth is really very, very fascinating. The more we see all those worlds around there, the more we understand that Earth has the conditions to develop, not just life. Life may be all over the place, but complex. Complex life is a different world. In order to sustain life for a long enough time, in order for individuals, for creatures with many different kinds of cells to emerge, is very difficult. All sorts of conditions have to be satisfied, and they are not. Which shows that this is a very precious place, and that life is rare, and intelligent life is extremely rare, and we have a moral duty to preserve it. With everything that we have. So it is not that science is telling that we are useless or worthless, quite the opposite. We are extremely important because we are very rare. In fact, there are no other humans in the whole universe. That means that we are really important, central. And instead of calling that anthropocentrism, I don't want to come back to that, it's human We are the creatures that know about time and have the awareness to think about it, to know about the history of our planet, the importance of it cosmically, and for that, we need to preserve it.